Hello everyone, thank you for joining us in Decolonizing Academia. My name is Sitlali Sitlamina Nawak, and I am the creator and founder of this resource where we want to democratize education and introduce you to amazing scholars that are doing the work in academia, transforming and reclaiming these institutions for our people's liberation and perspective. Today we have a very awesome guest. Her name is Raquel Rojas. She is an artist, art historian, educator, and muralist. She will be sharing her journey with us as we have this beautiful conversation about decolonizing academia. So to start off with, Raquel, can you tell us a little bit about what inspired you in, in art? You are a multifaceted artist. You do a lot. So can you give us your personal journey with art? How did that come to be? And what were some of your first projects when you discovered the, the world of art? Well, uh, art specifically, I think I didn't think I was going to be an artist. I remember being in high school and liking to draw and like making things. But my, um, my, you know, my history told me that I couldn't become an artist because it wasn't something that... Um, would make money, or you would, couldn't support your family, you couldn't help people with it. Like it was not, there was not a lot of money in it. Uh, so I remember being in high school and like just really liking to draw and making a mural in high school. And uh, I was like, no, I'm gonna go to school and become a lawyer. This is what I'm gonna do. So I went to, I went to UC Davis and I got my degree in political science um, and art because I was like, oh, well maybe I could just still do art, but I'll have political science there. Um, so that idea of like becoming an artist wasn't a thing. Like it just wasn't something that I believed it could be true. Um, until I started to see other people do it. And it wasn't until I had like some Chicano professors um, take me under their wing and help me realize that I could actually like make this a dream. Like this is something that people do. This is something that Chicanos do. something that people of color do. Um, but yeah, that was like a really hard, <laughs> that was a really hard realization, even though it was like something I did since I was like 10 years old, all the way until today, you know, so it was like a, that was a rough realization. Um, and some of the projects that I did, uh, when I started to realize that it was going to become a thing, like I was like, oh, I'm not going to go to law school, I'm going to go to art school, and I'm going to get an MFA and do all these other things. Um, I made this series of prints that had to do with my family's like migration stories so my dad's stories of like him coming to the u.s and like how he came and my mom's stories and my grandma's stories um and i made these prints like silk screen prints that had like all these colors and paintings about it uh, that's what i applied to my mfa programs with but that was like the first time i ever said like this is a project that i'm going to do because it's important so it wasn't and of course like art wasn't for me something that was just like a throwaway piece that it wasn't commercial it was like very specific to our history and like what we needed to tell yeah. wow and so you went from you got, you got your bachelor's in political science mm -hmm. and then when you started applying for the art mm -hmm. program for masters you took on this project right yeah so can you tell us your history of when how you ended up at Cal State LA you know what what were the projects that you were working on and where you're at with your growth with art as yourself as an artist as an art historian as a muralist like what's the relationship between your research what you're doing in academia and your own personal art okay so there's, there's a lot of things so <laughs> like, where, I, do we start? <laughs> where do we start so first when i applied to graduate schools the first time around after uc davis i applied to maybe like 10 or more schools and when I applied to those schools, they all sent me no letters. Every single one, it was like rejection after rejection after rejection. And I was like, why is that happening? Like, this sucks. And I, I started to take it out on myself. And I remember my professor who, he basically was like, you know, it's a game of statistics. Like, you, they don't, they sit around in a like, dark room and they just flip through slides. And one day it'll be your slide and they'll like it and they'll keep it. And then you'll go to that school. And I was like, what? And he's like, yeah, it's not what you think it is. It's not this idea that they don't care about you specifically. It's just like, it's a numbers game. You apply enough, you're going to get in. And I was like, what? This doesn't make any sense. 
Um, but I kept applying and I kept applying and I applied to a college in San Francisco. And I remember asking, like calling them on the phone and being like, hey, um, can you tell me why I didn't get into your school? And they're like, yes, we can have a conversation about it, but it's mostly about your like, material, like what you're presenting. And I was like, okay, that doesn't sound like, I thought it was like your personal statement. Like maybe you need to get better letters of recommendation. Maybe it's like, you know, your GPA, like whatever. But no, it was like, this is your artwork is what is what's stopping you. And I was like, okay, never mind. <laughs> uh, and my sister actually, she, she was telling me like, just change it, just change it for now. And then when you get in, you don't have to think about it and you'll change it back to however it was so that you can get into these schools. And I was like, no, I can't do that. Like, I'm just gonna have to get in whenever I get in. But when I got into UC, UC, Cal State LA, um, that was kind of this moment where I felt at first, I was like, how did I even get in? Like, what is, they didn't even send me a letter. <laughs> they didn't send me anything. I just like called them on in May because it was time. It was like, okay, well, there's no no, and there's no yes. Um, and then they, they called up the office and they were like, yeah, you're in. Why didn't you get a letter? And I was like, I have no idea. So I ended up going to Casa de LA and it was probably one of the best things that ever happened to me in my career because there, that's where I met my professor, whom, which I'm working with now, and all the women that I've been working with. And Casa de LA is like the only place with people of color in that, that way. There's no other school. At Davis, we had like 13%. Latinos and that didn't mean that they were all first generation that meant there was 13 percent of first second third hundredth generation of Latinos so they're very different um so when it came to Cal State LA it's a lot of first generation students and there's a lot of people of color there's a lot of women of color there's a lot of professors who are women <laughs> wow can you tell us when you applied for Cal State LA did you submit different artwork or was it your original artwork that you had been submitting to other schools I had, um, I think it was like, I still have that application. I have like maybe, I want to say five or seven of the first original ones. And then I added some more figurative drawings and then I had some abstractions. So I had a mixture. I was like, I'm going to throw this mixed bag in and see what, what, what will catch. Um, so I had some of the original stuff because I, you know, I thought it was beautiful. So whatever. Um, and then I started to make more work along the way too. Wow. So I never, like, stopped working. I was just, like, eventually I'm going to get in, so I have to keep making more work. So, yeah. And then um, being at Cal State LA brought me to... I applied at this round that I went in. I, I applied to Cal State LA, Long Beach, and there was another school. I think it was, like, Otis or something. And they both said no except Cal State LA. So it was just, like, this... It was a lot of really good things happening around this school. I mean, even my work after what 2015 has been so like the growth has exponentially it's 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 been like skyrocketing since then so that school specifically has helped me so much yeah. uh, and i i've been very familiar with a lot of your contribution at cal state la can you share a little bit about the work that you did for the mesoamerican art conference the art history program um, for those of you who don't know, they host an amazing conference every year, and you can look it up under their website, and I'm sure uh, Raquel can share more with us. But can you talk about that experience, you know, specifically, because um, you spearheaded a lot of that in yeah. your work. So after, so I'll, I'll backtrack a little bit. So when I went to get my master's in art, so my MFA, I was taking my first course in art history, and I was like, it was a really beautiful course because Professor Manuel Aguilar Moreno teaches all these like uh, Latino classes, Latino art history um, and Mexican art history. And I took one of the courses and I realized that I really loved art history, which is ridiculous because I hated art history before. I like hated the, to the core. I hated everything about it because of the way they taught it. And it was so boring and I knew it wasn't boring, but they just made these professors made it so freaking boring. Uh, and I took those classes and then um, I started to think like maybe I can do art history. And then he introduced me to the art history club, um, which was, he's like the advisor for that. And I met April, Erica, all these like amazing women, 
predominantly all Latina first generation women who are part of this club, who have been running this organization for I don't know how long. Uh, we've had a couple males in there, but they don't really last very long, which is really interesting, but that's a, that's a whole other story. <laughs> um, so this last year we put together the symposium uh, in honor of Miguel León Portilla, uh, and it was like 500 years since the arrival of the strangers. And that symposium was, I was president this year, but president's a little bit different. You know, president is, uh, you get to say you're president and you help deal with the problems that occur, like things that are weird. Um, but mostly it was like the collaboration of all the women together. It was like five of us who are working like, diligently every day on these projects. And we put together the symposium in partnership with the Getty and it was probably the way I just saw myself grow this way and I saw us grow like as an organization like we were able to like maintain this like really dope conference and not stress out about it too much uh, but we put in a lot of work um, I don't know yeah we prob I can probably share some other stuff like the links to the different talks but it was it was it was pretty awesome <laughs> wow Yes, and I was able to go the first day, and uh, we'll share some pictures hopefully right now. And then the links you're talking about, we can add them at the end of the video as well. Um, if we can now move on to your your personal research, mm -hmm. your own. I know right now you're working on your thesis. Mm -hmm. um, can you kind of share some of your personal highlights, your journey with what you're researching, what you're looking at? Um, what are some of the experiences you've come across? What are some of the interests that you have in art history? Mm -hmm. And when I personally met you was when you were giving your, your oral presentation on the Tree of Life mm -hmm. um, in Art of Mesoamerica. So that's really, really important research. Um, do you guys keep an eye out for that? And just kind of share that particular journey with the evolution of your own research and where you're at. What, what makes you the most excited about your research? Okay, so I'll start back where I was earlier. <laughs> um, I used to hate art history because it was so boring. And I thought it was boring because I wasn't included. There was never anything about like Mesoamerica or even like post-colonial time. Like there was just nothing about Mexicans. Um, so I went to Davis and I had this, we had as a mandatory course, we had to take three art history courses. And I passed each one with like a C minus, like just barely, not getting a D, but C minus. Um, and I remember sitting in class and just like listening to everything and just not absorbing any of it. Um, so when I went to Cal State LA, I had a professor and he taught me that we're part of the canon. Uh, so we had the Mexican muralist class where we studied Diego, Siqueiros, Orozco, and Frida. And then we had like the other classes like about Mesoamerican art, Andean art, um, colonial art, um, Aztec art specific, just, just, just on the Aztecs, like a whole course on it. Um, and you still didn't get to see everything. So there was like all this material that had been never introduced to me until I was freaking 25 years old. And I, I was I, I was mortified because I was like, why didn't we have this at Davis, a huge institution? Like, did they just not have money to pay for a teacher? Like, what was it? Because they had a lot of freaking teachers in, like, Italian art and all this other stuff. But, like, what about, you know, Mesoamerica? So they just hired one, 2018, I think. That's too late. <laughs> I didn't get those courses. So... Um, I was able to see art history for what it was and that inspired me to look deeper into it because I was like okay well if this is art history I want to see if it's um, like it has to make sense to me I guess so I started to look at the text and like started to see that I know that you are familiar with this too like you start to see that women are subservient women are this women are that like where the, the parallelism where women of mess society were parallel to men like just a, a little bit demeaning in a lot of the texts and we didn't have a lot written about us I didn't understand that at first I was complacent with the idea of like Koyoshaki and and 
and not seeing a lot of cool stuff. And then I was like, wait, there's more. I'm not two-sided. I'm not two-dimensional. I am a very multi-dimensional, multi-faceted person. How is it possible that we only have these, like, deities to look at? Um, yeah, so then I started to research, which led me into this path of, like, really investigating stuff. And at the same time, I was making my MFA thesis on the uterus and violence against women. So I was specifically looking at women in Mexico, the United States, and Canada, and like their uh, trauma. So the amount of violence towards women in these specific areas and who is targeted the most is mostly indigenous women, black women, and Mexican women. So we have this hatred towards women in the Americas. So I'm like, oh, this, this is similar to what I'm reading. Like there is no support for us. So I was like painting the uterus and making prints of the uterus and like constantly looking at the female anatomy um, so that one day I was looking at a, what was I looking at? I was looking at the Codex Vindomonense, it's the Codex Vienna, it has a different name, but and like the indigenous name, I forget. But there's an image on page, I think it's page 37, we can probably show a picture of it. Um, and I looked at it and I was like, this is really interesting because it looks just like a uterus. And my professor was like, oh, that's the tree of life. That's a tree of Amapoala or something. And um, I was like, wait, what? Like, this is a tree. This definitely has two ovaries. And this is the uterus area, like the vaginal area. And there's people coming out of it. So I was like, oh, this must be feminized. Like, this must be associated to the woman. And it's like, no, 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 this is just a tree. And I was like, wait, wait, where is like, is there more interpretations of this? Like, where is this about? Like, like yes, it has to do with like the cosmos and all that beautiful stuff, but it, it doesn't necessarily come back and be like, yes, the cosmos is here, but like, this is also an analogy of like birth and like the female body. Like, there was no, there was the, it doesn't feel like there's a strong correlation there for whatever reason. Um, but they did have it within caves. Like if you look at caves, in all different societies, not even just Mesoamerica, but all over the world, caves are interpreted as like feminine, as women's, as wombs, as like those areas. So we already associate that, but not the tree. So I was like, there's like, there was something about the trees that was calling my attention and it kept calling my attention. Um, so then I started to research more about the trees of life. And so at, at this point, you're drawing these comparisons, right? So you're making this analysis and you're getting pushback is that like are you being told like no like how you said no this is just art this is not like were you told this is not a female anatomy or this isn't like did you encounter that resistance within like your research or like people are, like not trying to give that much importance to women's bodies or women's anatomy or what was that what was that like was it were you looked at as oh my gosh that's a great analysis like that's a great observation or was it like no it's not or were you minimized was your analysis minimized was it welcomed was it challenged what was that like um well i think the first time for my professor i think he just didn't understand what i was saying like literally because he thought i was just going to do an analysis of all the trees of life i was like no, no no i'm going to interpret them as this other thing and he was like, oh, okay. Um, but that came until later. Like, now he understands fully what I'm doing. And he hasn't, I don't think he's ever really not supported me. I think the one thing that he told me that was really positive was if someone disagrees with you, they have to write a paper about it. Like, they have to use facts just like you did to disagree with you. And I was like, oh, okay, that sounds really good. Um, but a lot of the, sadly, a lot of the women that I met in um, academia, when I would talk to them about it, they would kind of be like, what are you talking about? The first thing they would say is like, and I was like, oh, what, did they're like, what is your research? Because I was talking to professors for PhD programs. Um, and some of the professors were women. And they'd be like, oh, what are, you, what are you talking about? What do you mean they're female uteruses? And I was like, well, they have the same shape and structure. And they were like, wait, what? And they're like, wait, hold on, let me, let me look this up. So they had to verify before that they could even, like, I don't even know if they actually knew what it looked like originally, that they had to look it up and they were like, oh. And I think one of the teachers or one of the professors had told me, she's like, I think you have to find all of them in order to make this a thing. 
And I was like, oh, okay. I can't do that in MA thesis for sure. Um, I thought I could, but she was just like, yeah, you can't just use one or two. You have to use all of them that exist. And I was like, that's, you know, I think of the things that they have said about women. And I'm like, how many did you look at before you came up with this, like, bizarre freaking idea that we were all subservient or whatever? But I have to find literally every single tree in order to prove my case. I'm like, <laughs> And, and speaking of that, right, speaking of doing your research, coming across all of these viewpoints, can you kind of share what keeps you going? Mm -hmm. What pushes you every day to, to write your thesis, to continue the research? Because as we have experienced and we know it can be very exhausting, very demoralizing, especially as women of color in academia, um, there is a lack of our voices, of our, our representation, our giving credit to our labor, to our research. And so what what keeps you going? What's what's that that motivation for you? Um it's hard. It's really hard cuz you, you you know, I used to think my friends could give me that, but they can't. They at times uh, would just look at me and they'd be like, "Oh, what are you talking?" Like I would be talking to them like you sound like you're saying something this is what they were saying you sound like you're saying something really cool but I have no clue what you're talking about and it makes you feel so crazy because you're just like wait am I crazy like does this even make sense um, but the part that I think kept me going the most is like <laughs> going to conferences so you go to conferences and you're there to speak about like I went to CAA and that is one of the, the California Arts Association. No, it's a College Arts Association, sorry. Um, and it has all these like leaders in academia, in art history, in all these different subjects you go to studies, and they're all like mostly just art associated. But there was, a, this last year was a huge, uh, it was they had a lot of papers on Mesoamerican American studies so there was a lot of people who were not people of color who were they're talking about our history and at one point there was somebody talking about uh, associations with color and how like uh, I think it was the Aztecs or Nahuatl has like Chile is an association with the color red and like how it's also food and like blah 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 and like Chapapote is like an association of black, um, but it's also an association to something they know familiar as like a substance and it's sticky and all this other stuff. So it's a specific like way to associate colors. But it's like, yeah, we know that, but like we never wrote it. Like we don't write these things down, but who's writing our history is like all these like white women and white males who are in these conferences delivering their papers. They're gonna write their dissertations if they'd already had if they haven't already or write articles and it's like it feels awful like even reading all the texts that I had to read they're not from people of color for the most part they're all like white scholars which isn't a bad thing it's just like that's where we are right now and if we don't make that change this is what I have to go through and this sucks because you're like sitting there trying to write your thesis you're like I hate this. I don't want to write it anymore and then you have to remember like oh yeah like the reason you have to write this is because they aren't going to write it. And you want to give something back so that the future of us can read these papers and be like, oh, they got things wrong. You should probably investigate more. Because we don't, there's a lot of these things that seem like you'll just read a book and all of a sudden you're just like, this doesn't sound right. But they have all these like, you know, they reference all these people who have been saying these things for years. and. Yeah, if we don't write, I guess if we don't write this history, then we're just not going to have it. Um, to follow up on that, what, what, what's the contribution you want to make to to history, to our community, to to the way we look at ourselves, at art, world art? You know, what what's something that you want people to know about your work and your contribution years to come? I think the one thing that I've learned is that like history is a construction like 
our knowledge is a construction. Like, we can construct knowledge, too. I think that we often go through school and, like, think that everything that they say is, like, correct, right, and cannot be refuted. But the reality is that people sometimes say things like, one of the guys, what is his name? Oh, I forget his name. He's like a famous scholar in Meso Studies, had said some things over and over again about the Maya Halif, the Mayan glyphs. Sorry. Um, he's been saying these things for thousands or hundreds of years, and then, you know, somebody comes in and changes it, and then all of a sudden, like, that knowledge is thrown away because it was wrong. So I think understanding that we also have the power to create that knowledge. It's not just people who are educated or have, like, are, you know, white. Um, but, like, even just telling my colleagues, like, just telling my friends, being like, hey, you should write a paper about what you think about these, like, Colima dogs and her just like be like I don't know what to say it's like just talk about what you think and she's like I don't know so instead she writes something that's a little bit easier for her um, that's not something that's too far out you know and sometimes we have to take those risks um, but yeah like knowledge is a construction you can create it you just have to find your resources right interdisciplinary approaches are like the best um, yeah it's like definitely number one contribution and lastly to give to to think about students who are coming into these spaces you know they're interested in art they're interested in in history in general um and they struggle to to, to be inspired to be motivated they feel out of place they feel like they don't belong they feel that what's the point they're just gonna continue repeating old scholarship what can you tell that student who's showing up first day of school, you know, first generation or whichever, what are the, the advice that you wish someone would have told you, you know, years ago when you stepped into these spaces? What is something that you think they would really benefit from, from your wisdom? I think I had really good mentors um, because I do have something that they told me or he told me when... My mentor was Malakias Mubaya when I was in undergrad, and a lot of, till now, actually. Uh, but he told me, he's like, you can't drop out because then you're going to become another statistic. And it's like, oh, that's right. Like, statistically proven, we're not supposed to be here. Statistically proven, we're not supposed to be in higher education. We're not supposed to go and write books. We're not supposed to do these things. This is not where we're supposed to be. But that's okay. If we stop what we're doing, we're just gonna contribute to that whole like understanding of ourselves. Like we have the Chicano pipeline that tells us where we're supposed to be. And I'm part of the point zero, I think zero zero one percent now, or zero one percent, something like that. That's not okay. So I don't wanna do that and neither should they. Like you can't just give up, you have to keep going. Um, and it sucks sometimes, but that self-care is, like, super important. You got to take time off and go camping or, like, bake cakes or do whatever the hell you need to do to, like, refocus and be like, okay, now I'm okay. Now I can continue. Because otherwise you're just going <sighs> to fall into cycles of, like, self-loathing and stuff. And it's, like, not cool. Um, I don't know if that answered the yeah, question. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and to the last question is going to be, once you submit your thesis, once it is accepted and this chapter of your education has ended, what's next? Have you thought about what you want to do next? What's your next plan? What are your next projects? Well, I mean, I have a couple projects. So I thought I was in a rush. I don't know why. And I kind of feel like I do know why. It was like this like weird competition that I had put myself in for success because of things that happened in the past. I thought I was competing with somebody. And I was like, actually, I'm not. Like, I don't care. And I want to take a break because it's exhausting and you can't do it full time. Like, I thought I can just jump. I jumped from one MA to another. So I got my MFA and then I jumped to the MA. So I've been in school for about four years now getting these two master's degrees and I just need to stop 
reassess and really reevaluate where I want to go because I just had like this idea that I wanted to go anywhere and I don't just want to go anywhere um, because I've already set roots here and I want to continue those roots here in LA um, and make the projects that I've been dying to do because I'm a muralist. I'm also an artist who creates like um, pop-up exhibitions in the middle of nowhere and I haven't done any of that and I haven't done any of that in LA. Um, some of the things that I've wanted to do are like uh, yeah, just setting up shop basically for people in different areas of LA, but that'll happen soon. Um, that and just paint more murals, like collaborate with schools, figure out what it is, but like more community murals. Awesome. And just to end the video, any, any last thing you would like to tell anybody, any useful information, any tips, any resources, any websites that you check out? Where would you recommend someone to look up for inspiration, for guidance? You know, that's interesting. I think, <laughs> I, I don't know, man. Like, I think, you know, if it feels right, you're going to do it. And if it doesn't feel like what you're going to do, it's fine. But, you know, getting your MA, as you know, and like getting, going into higher education and planning all these things is like, it takes a toll on you, but you can't blame yourself. You can never blame yourself because this is like historical trauma. This is all the stuff that you feel when you're in those spaces, when you feel like rejected, when you feel like not a part of something. It's because they've made it so that we feel that way. And we're not supposed to feel that way. We're supposed to feel safe. And, you know, when we do feel that way, we've got to find community. Always try to find your community. Otherwise, you're going to be freaking so sorry the whole time. <laughs> uh, so, yeah find community within whatever space you have. Mine was our history society. They like held it together. And despite the fact that sometimes I couldn't share all the information I wanted to, they were just a group of friends that I can hang out with and just be brown with. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Raquel, for sitting with us and sharing your journey. Um, I, I welcome, I, I congratulate, I look up to you. Uh, you're very inspiring. And which is why I want other people to know who you are and your work, because we need to create our own narrative. We need to create our own resources, our own education, our own content, and let others know that we exist because through our existence and our work, others are going to be motivated as well. And they need to see themselves in you and they need to know what badass fucking scholars look like mm -hmm. and what they work and what they sound like because we're not represented we're not in the mainstream we're mm -hmm. not given the proper you know channels and representation that we deserve so i want to thank you for being part of of this project so yeah. everyone watching thank you so much for watching and encourage you to please look at her work you know listen to this share this video with other people um, let them know that there are some badass women in academia women of color who are creating shifts and powerful movements. So thank you very much. Thanks.